Thank you for choosing Lawline to fulfill your CLE requirements, and welcome to this audio seminar. Please keep in mind that a verification code word will be played during the seminar. You will need to enter this word on lawline.com in order to receive credit. We hope you enjoy this audio seminar. Good morning, and welcome to the Introduction to Entertainment Law. Uh, my name is Ralph De Palma, and this morning we will be covering the basics of entertainment law. Um, entertainment law is a vast subject area. I'm often asked, like, what is entertainment law? Well, entertainment law is a mix of a lot of different areas, uh, contract law, copyright law, uh, rights of publicity, First Amendment, uh, trademark, Entertainment lawyers uh, face issues from all areas of law, um, including family law, um, securities regulation, labor law, rights of minors. Um, as you can see, this involves federal law and involves various state laws. Um, while it's not possible to be an expert in all areas of the law, an entertainment lawyer and a good entertainment lawyer is really required to know when their client may or may not be violating uh, an area of the law. So you should know whether or not your client is violating security laws or at least know enough to ask somebody whether or not they're violating security laws when raising money for a play or for a film, um, or whether or not they may actually lose rights because a minor can rescind a contract. So being able to spot these issues and knowing when to ask for help um, is really an important component of being an entertainment lawyer, being a, a lawyer, and being successful at it. So I'm going to focus on some of the more general areas of copyright law and rights of publicity law that are particular to entertainment. Um, so copyright law. What is copyright law? Well, a copyright is a limited monopoly that is given to creators in order to provide economic incentive to create works. Now, the origin of copyright law in the United States goes back to the Constitution. In Article 1, Section 8, it states that Congress shall have the power to promote progress of art, science, and the useful, useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and drawings. So the first Copyright Act in the United States was enacted in 1790, short, shortly after ratification of the Constitution, and it gave protection to original works for a period of 14 years. Uh, the Copyright Act has undergone many revisions uh, and amendments and rewrites since then, but the basic content, uh, concept remains the same. It's to protect original works of authorship for a limited time so that authors may reap the benefit of their work. Um, in order to qualify for copyright protection, a work must be an original work of authorship, and it must be fixed in a tangible medium from which it can be perceived, reproduced, or otherwise communicated. And we find that in section 102 of the copyright laws. So let's take a look at the elements of copyright. Number one, it must be an original work. Um, this is the first issue that you face. Ideas alone cannot be copyrighted. I'm, I'm often asked this question, especially by uh, new creators, people uh, you know with no experience in copyright law who are creating a, a film or a book or a screenplay, and they ask, well, can I copyright my idea? Can I protect it? The short answer is, is no. Um, ideas generally cannot be protected by copyright law. Um, neither can procedures or processes, systems, concepts, uh, methods of operation. So if you have a client and they wanted to make a movie um, that was a romance between two people from warring families uh, who tragically kill themselves in pursuit of a forbidden love, the idea itself would not be copyrightable. If they disclose this idea to a studio and the studio moved forward and made uh, a film based on this idea, um, it would not be a copyright infringement. Uh, what the client would need to do is they need to develop the story and add original elements to it. Then it would qualify for copyright protection. Once they start to flesh out the story, give it characters, names, places, settings, then it will be an original work that merits copyright protection. Uh, maybe the story takes place in Verona, Italy, or maybe that story takes place in uh, the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Uh, the love story concept can take on many different forms, um, and each of those forms can be protectable 
if the story is fleshed out, if the concepts uh, remain just a vague idea, then the, the theme alone does not qualify for copyright protection. Uh, the next element is, is fixed in a tangible medium. So the story must exist outside of a person's head. Um, it must be written down, ty typed into a computer program, um, fixed in pictures or sculpture. Uh, it, it doesn't matter how it's fixed, but it does need to be fixed in some tangible medium. Um, now, as a practicing entertainment lawyer, uh, aside from clients asking you whether or not they could protect their ideas, usually you, you will be dealing with works of authorship that are original works. Uh, there, there's a relatively low threshold uh, for originality. So uh, as you can see, section 102 details some, some of the works that can be copyrighted. And you see the list, literary works, musical works, uh, dramatic works, pantomimes, choreographic works, etc. As an entertainment lawyer, you will be dealing with most of, of those types of works. Um, so copyright registration, is it necessary? Now you could register your copyright in the copyright office. Um, the copyright itself attaches the minute that the work is fixed in a tangible medium. So registering the copyright itself does not grant copyright protection. Copyright protection attaches as soon as the work is fixed in a tangible medium. Uh, the copyright registration, however, uh, gives you important rights. One, one, of, one, of the, one of the things that registration does is it establishes a very definite time of when your work was created. Uh, in a copyright infringement in ca a case, that very well may become an issue. When, when was your work created? Uh, copyright registration will give you a date certain that at least it was filed. Um, there are also other benefits to registration that are particular to copyright litigation. Um, you, you may be entitled to attorney's fees, although that, that's not common. Um, it also lets you take advantage of the federal courts. Um, so let's look at the actual rights that you get when you have a copyright. So we think of copyright as a bundle of rights. Um, Section 106 identifies all of the exclusive rights that authors get in their work. So the first exclusive right is the right to reproduce the work, to make copies of it. Um, you get the right to prepare derivative works based on your work. So if you wrote a play, you can make a movie out of it. You have a derivative right to do that. Um, you have the right to distribute copies of the work. So it's a distribution right. You have the right to perform the work. Um, that would be you know, musical works. You have a performance right separate and apart from the right to distribute the work and separate and apart from the right to make copies of the work. Um, and you have the right to display the work. Um, so for photographs, uh, architectural works, etc., there's the display right. Uh, now for sound recordings only, there, there is somewhat of a, a special exception to the bundle of rights. Sound recordings get a performance right only for digital transmission. So a non-digital transmission um, would not qualify in for a sound recording to receive the performance right. There's no performance right in sound recordings except for performances that are made digitally. Um, this is an interesting uh, area, and, and there, there is a reason for it. But first, let, let's examine the difference between sound recordings and musical compositions, right? So if you think of a piece of recorded music, there are actually two copyrights in each recorded piece of music. One for the sound recording itself, and two for the underlying musical composition. Um, so the musical composition is, is the song, the piece of music that was written by the composer. Um, for example, let's take the song Yesterday, written by John Lennon and Paul McCartney. Um, they own the copyright, originally owned the copyright, in the musical composition take a recording of that song by Ray Charles. Ray Charles would be the owner of the sound recording of that particular version of the musical composition. Uh, Katy Perry also recorded that song and she, along with her producer, would, would be the owner of the copyright in the sound recording, uh, whereas Lennon and McCartney remain as the owners of the musical composition. 
So sound recordings were not protected originally under U.S. copyright law. In fact, uh, it wasn't until February 15th, 1972, that sound recordings became protected under federal copyright law. Uh, prior to that, they were protected under some state laws. Uh, they're protectable under certain theories of unfair competition, but not federal copyright protection. So when the um, when when sound recordings became protected in 1972, um, th there was there was a strong lobby um, by the broadcasting industry to prevent sound recordings from getting a performance right uh, because they would have to pay out massive amounts of money to owners of record companies. They're already paying out large sums of money to the owners of musical compositions for the performances of those musical compositions over their television waves, uh, radio waves. Uh, it, through their, their broadcasts. Um, so sound recordings did not get a performance right um, for those analog broadcasts. Later on in the uh, enactment of the Digital Copyright uh, Mid Millennium Act, the sa sound recordings were given the performance right in um, digital, for digital transmissions. So any time, um, well, let, let's, let's take a look at the divisibility of these rights. Um, so section 201 D2 uh, provides that the exclusive rights comprised in a copyright, including any subdivision of any of the rights specified by 106, the exclusive rights, may be transferred and owned separately. So each of these rights are divisible. The rights can be unbundled. Um, a copyright owner in a motion picture can license the right to distribute and display the work to one person um, and to make derivative works to another person. Uh, th this, this is important because it, it allows owners of copyrights to maximize their revenue. Um, distribution rights can be licensed from territory to territory. So you can license a distribution of a film in the UK and license it to someone else in France and license it to someone else in China. Or you could carve up all of the territories to maximize revenue or bid that against um, somebody else who's looking for distribution throughout the entire world or larger territories like the EU and all of Asia. Um, Let's take a look at copyright ownership. Um, so as we've seen, a copyright is a bundle of rights. These rights can be unbundled and sold, licensed, etc., cetera, uh, separately. So some difficulties come up when people work together and they prepare uh, joint works. So a joint work is defined in section 101 as a work prepared by two or more authors with the intention that their contributions be merged into inseparable or interdependent parts of a unitary whole. So there must be intent to create the joint work in the, in the first place. So if two people were sitting down to write a song together and one person wrote lyrics and the other person wrote music, there is a joint work. There was the intention to create a song um, and they would own an undivided part of the whole. Each owner would own an undivided part of the whole. If, however, somebody wrote a poem and another person wrote a piece of music without any lyrics and then wanted to use the lyrics as part of their song, that's not a joint work because there was no original intent on the part of the lyricist to combine his poem with the music. Um, then that would obviously require a license or some other type of an agreement between the two copyright owners. There would be two separately owned copyright works. Um, when, when a joint work is created, the law assumes that it was created in equal portions. So if three people sat down and wrote a song together, uh, the song would be owned one-third, one-third, and one-third, absent a writing that indicates otherwise. 
Um, so th this is an important point, especially when you have multiple creators uh, working on, it, it comes up a lot in the music industry, um, where there are multiple creators that may come into the studio at various times and work on a particular song. If there's nothing in writing, maybe the person who only added a, a small bit, a little bit of, you know, a few lyrics or, or maybe, you know, change some of the music around a little bit, they, they could end up with a full share of ownership if there's not a writing to the contrary. A lot of times clients will, you know, find it uncomfortable to have those discussions. Those discussions are best had after after the song is written. Um, many times you defer to the, the managers and let the managers of the artist work it out, and sometimes lawyers have to work it out. You, usually uh, you, you don't want to go that far with it, and hopefully the um, clients themselves can decide, well, you know, your contributions maybe were 10% of the song, or 15, or 20, 25, whatever it might be. Uh, but it's really important um, as an advisor and as a counselor to counsel your clients to make sure that they make those decisions early on, because the last thing you want to happen is for the, the, the song or the other work product to make lots of money, and then people not be sure of what their ownership is, and then have somebody come in looking for a full half or one third or whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, so joint owners are, are kind of like tenants in common. Um, they have an undivided interest in the whole work. Um, so if uh, in the case where somebody wrote the lyrics and somebody wrote the music, uh, each owner owns the entire song uh, 50%. It's not as if one person owns the lyric side and the other person owns the music side. Um, so what, what are the types of things that joint owners can do? Um, well, first of all, they can enter into non-exclusive licenses without the permission or consent of the other joint owners. Um, their, their duty is to account to the others. So one joint owner can license uh, a song or a book, whatever it might be, on a non-exclusive basis to somebody else, receive money for that, and as long as they account to their other joint owners, uh, they, they, they've not uh, violated anybody's rights. Um, what they cannot do is they cannot enter into exclusive licenses on behalf of all of the owners. Um, you need permission from every owner in a joint copyright in order to transfer any incident of ownership. So let, let's take a look at what a transfer of ownership is under the copyright law. Um, transfer of ownership you find in section 201 um, and uh, I'm sorry, ownership is found in, in 201, right? The, the, the definition of transfer of copyright ownership is found in section 101, and that definition says that a transfer of copyright ownership is an assignment, mortgage, exclusive license, or any other conveyance, alienation, hypothecation of a copyright, or any of the exclusive rights in a copyright whether or not it is limited in time or place or effect, but not including a non-exclusive license. So non-exclusive licenses are not a transfer of ownership. Um, and that's one of the reasons why joint owners can make a, a, a enter into non-exclusive licenses without the permission of the other owners. Uh, but any sort of copyright uh, transfer of ownership, there must be uh, a writing and there must be consent of all of the copyright owners. So section 204A um, states that any transfer of copyright ownership must be in writing. Uh, an important point. So if you have a client that is acquiring rights to a book or a play to make a film, that right, that transfer must be in writing and you must make sure that the transfer is executed by all of the copyright owners um, in in that in the underlying work. Um, so how you know how how does this come up in practice? Um, let, let's take licensing a song. Uh, perhaps you have a uh, uh, an advertiser that wants to use a song in a commercial, um, and they want an exclusive license for a certain period of time. All of the owners would have to sign off on that. Uh, one owner could not enter into that agreement. Uh, but what if it were a television producer who wanted to use a song in a, in a television show on a non-exclusive basis? Well, then any of those owners could license the song um, and they would have to account to the other owners. Um, 
th- this is why songwriters and other co-authors, you know, will usually enter into some sort of, uh, you know, co-authorship agreement or collaboration agreement uh, that spells out what the authors may do. Uh, th- this situation comes up sometimes where you have uh, songwriters where one songwriter is also the performer and they're signed to a recording contract and they are recording a song, they're writing a song with somebody else, but under their recording contract they're required to give the recording company a mechanical license, that's a license to use the underlying composition at a reduced rate. Um, In order for them to comply with the recording contract, they need to enter into an agreement with their co-writer that states the co-writer will accept that reduced rate. Um, If the co-writer does not accept the reduced rate, well, then the, the extra payment, if you will, that the record company has to make for the license of the song will come out of the recording artist's share. Um, so you have these sort of co-administration agreements, uh, collaboration agreements, writer split agreements, uh, all which detail what uh, people, what authors, co-authors can do with their works. Um, work made for hire. Th- this is a, a very important copyright concept um, having to do with ownership. Um, essentially, when a work is a work made for hire, then the creator of the work is not the author, but rather the company or person that hired the creator becomes the author of the work for copyright purposes. Um, why is this important? Um, it's, it, it's, the, the, the distinction seems like a fine line distinction, but it's, it's actually a, a very important distinction because Um, the authors, authors of works get a reversion right. They get the right to get their work back after a certain period of time. Um, So after it's 35 years, uh, an author has the right of reversion to get their copyright back if they had transferred the work. If, however, they were a work made for hire, they are not the author for copyright purposes, And the company that hired them would own the copyright as the author, um, and they would have the reversion right and would not be something that they would need to worry about. So the the reason for this now is historically, uh, copyright was divided into two terms. And the the, the concept behind that was that most authors, uh, when first starting out, they don't have great bargaining power. Uh, In many cases, they're forced to sell their works at a very low price. Um, So in keeping with the stated policy of promoting the arts and securing to authors the rights in their their work, uh, Congress thought it best to give authors two terms of copyright so that after the first term they could negotiate or or renegotiate their existing deal. Um, So prior to the enactment of the Copyright Act of 1976, which is the current act, uh, which has been amended many times, um, then author was given a two two 28-year terms of copyright. So the idea again being that if they made a bad deal after 28 years, they would have the chance to renegotiate that deal. Um, it, and fortunately, it didn't work out exactly like that for most authors. Um, courts had said that a, a copyright, uh, it could be both terms of copyright could essentially be sold in the beginning, so authors would end up selling both, both terms of copyright. Um, but with the enactment of the 1976 Act, Congress did away with the two terms. Uh, the, the, the length of a copyright, how long a copyright lasts, is um, the life of the author plus 70 years for individuals and 95 years for companies, uh, for, for published works. So instead of the two-year term, what uh, Congress did not want to lose the reversion right for authors. Uh, they said, well, after 35 years, an author can get back their copyright. Um, They also said that an author couldn't sell the reversion right. So it becomes an automatic uh, thing. Now, you could imagine, um, you know, coming back to the work for hire concept, you could imagine a movie studio investing millions of dollars in making a film. They hire somebody to write the screenplay, hire directors, actors, cinematographers, editors, uh, and dozens of other people that 
contribute copyrightable material to, to the film. Um, if, after 35 years, everyone were able to get their copyright back and you had a hugely successful movie, um, it would be a disaster for most film companies. Uh, they probably would not be able to afford to renegotiate a lot of the rights or they would be held up. It would, it would stifle industry. So work made for hire allows companies, like a film company if you're making a movie, to hire people on a work made for hire basis and then the, the movie studio or, or production company becomes the author for copyright purposes. Now, you can't do this with every copyright. The statute has two main ways in which a copyright could become a work made for hire. Uh, the first one is a work that's prepared by an employee within the scope of his, and her, his or her employment. So if you're a regular employee for a company uh, and you're under the direction and control of the company and you work on the company premises and you're using the company property and they basically you know, can tell you what to do, tell you when to show up, when to work, um, they're, they're your employer and they will be able to have a work prepared within that scope of employment as a work made for hire for them where they're the author. Um, the, the, the other way that a copyright uh, work can become a, a work made for hire is a work that's specially ordered or commissioned for use as, and there, there's a list of very uh, specific items that can be uh, commissioned as, as works made for hire. Uh, one would be a contribution to a collective work. Uh, the other, a part of a motion picture or other audiovisual work. A translation, supplementary work, compilation, instructional text, text, uh, answer material for a test, or an atlas. Um, then the statute says if the parties agree in a written instrument, so it must be an instrument in writing that identifies it as a work made for hire, signed by them, that the work should be considered a work made for hire. So th this is an exclusive list. Um, a number of years back, the, the, there was a bit of hubbub about whether or not a sound recording on its own could be a work made for hire. Um, sound recordings, as you see, are not on the exclusive list. Um, every major record company's agreement, though, states that the sound recordings made under that agreement uh, are works made for hire. Um, and they also have a sentence in there that says, and if they're not a work made for hire, they are assigned to us by operation of this agreement. Again, remember the difference. If it's a work made for hire, company becomes the author, no right of reversion. If it is assigned to the company, there is a right of reversion, and the authors can get their right back after 35 years. Um, so Congress, as they were going on, on holiday in uh, the year 2000, uh, added sound recordings to the exclusive list uh, as part of a, a larger uh, bill that they were passing at the end of the year. Uh, when, when the artist community realized what had happened, uh, the law was rescinded and uh, sound recordings was pulled out and the Copyright Act now specifically states that no legal significance should be given to the fact that sound recordings were put into the list and then abruptly pulled out. Uh, yet, it seems that the significance is obvious and certainly can't use it uh, in court, but it seems that uh, it's fairly well settled that a sound recording on its own cannot be a work made for hire, which is to distinguish it from a movie company commissioning a sound recording to be used in a film. That, that clearly is on the exclusive list because it's a work that was commissioned as part of a motion picture or other audiovisual work. Um, Let's move on to the next um, important concept in copyright law, and that is fair use. Um, Section 107 of the copyright law um, it covers the fair use doctrine. Th th this had been a uh, common law doctrine developed by the courts, and it was codified as part of the uh, 1976 Copyright Act. So the, the, the fair use doctrine is, is probably one of the m more difficult doctrines to apply um, and one of the more difficult things that entertainment lawyers have to deal with. Uh, the, the reason that it's so complex is that it's, it's fact specific, it's highly fact specific. Every, every instance of it is necessarily different. 
Um, the concept, however, is, is fairly easy and straightforward. Um, you know, copyright, as we have seen, is a limited monopoly. Uh, and one of the main policy drivers is to promote the arts. Uh, Congress thought that it would be useful and to, 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 to society um, if they put limits on a copyright owner's exclusive rights. They didn't want people holding back their rights. Um, and they, they want to encourage the, the dissemination of, of works. Um, so Section 107 states that notwithstanding the provisions of 106, which is the exclusive rights provision, the fair use of a copyrighted work, including such use by reproductions in copies or by any other means specified in that section uh, for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, uh, including multiple copies, scholarship, research, uh, is not an infringement of copyright. And in determining whether the use made of a work in any particular case is a fair use, uh, the factors to be considered shall include the purpose and character of the work, the nature of the work, the amount and substantiality used of the work, and the effect on the potential market. And the fact that a work may be an unpublished work um, does not bar a finding of fair use if the finding is made on the consideration of the four factors um, and, and the preamble. So if, if we look at the first part of the, of the statute, um, it says that the fair use of a copyrighted work um, for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, so, so such as indicates that it's a non-exclusive list. And these are just examples of the types of things that you might be able to use a copyrighted work for, um, but you still have to evaluate it in light of these four factors. Um, one of the uh, more important Supreme Court cases on this subject is Campbell versus Acuff Rose Music. Uh, you can find that at 510 U.S. 569. Uh, this is 1994 Supreme Court. Um, so the plaintiff in, in the original action uh, was Acuff Rose Music. Um, they own the copyright of the famous Roy Orbison song, Oh Pretty Woman. The defendant used part of the song in a parody. Um, the defendants were members of the uh, group Two, uh, Two Life Crew, um, and they made a rap song that used the Roy Orbison uh, riff and, and part of the song. Um, so they, they originally tried to license the song from A. Cuff Rose. They, they, they went to them and asked them for a license, and A. Cuff Rose denied the license. Uh, they used the song anyway, and they were sued. Um, the district court had ruled for the defending, citing fair use. Uh, the Court of Appeals in the Sixth Circuit reversed, uh, and the Supreme Court reversed the Court of Appeals. Um, possibly the most important uh, theory to come from Judge Souter's opinion uh, was the concept of transformativeness. Um, let's, let's take a, a look at the first factor in fair use. Um, why is the work being used? Uh, what, what's the purpose and character of the use? Um, so Judge Suda had suggested that, well, first we look at the preamble um, and is the, is the use for criticism, for comment, for news reporting, teaching, um, you know, it's an instructive list and not an exclusive list. Uh, and he comes up with the fact that this was a parody, um, and that parody is, is criticism, and that it certainly you know, fits within the, the, the types of uses that uh, should qualify as fair use. Um, he goes on to say that the central purpose of the inquiry in the first fair use character, right, the purpose and character of the use, is to see whether the new work merely supersedes the objects of the original creation, or instead adds something new with a further purpose or different character, altering the first with a new expression, meaning, or message. 
It asks, in other words, whether and to what extent the new work is transformative. And thus is the birth of the transformative use doctrine that's part of this first uh, fair use factor. Um, in, in, in some way, uh, th this, this has become somewhat controversial um, as some of the cases have taken this transformative use and, and kind of made it um, greater, if you will, in, in, in scope than it may have originally been intended, um, all of the fair use factors are, are to be weighed um, together. And, and no one fair use factor is truly more important than the other, uh, but the first factor has seemed to take on a, a bit of a, a life of its own, uh, and, and that comes from the fact that Judge Souter, in, in his opinion in Campbell, also said that the more transformative the new work, the less significance of the other factors, uh, like commercialism, that may weigh against the finding of fair use. So the, many cases had picked up on this transformative use theory, um, and, and it culminates in the case of Cariou v. Prince, um, which is a second appeals, uh, sec second circuit court of appeals case. Um, you can find it at 714 F3rd 694. Uh, again, second circuit 2013. Um, so in, in looking at the purpose and character of, of the use, um, th this court had taken Souter's uh, opinion, and, and this, this opinion has been somewhat criticized um, by, by scholars and, and even by other courts, as, as we'll, we will see. Um, so the, the facts, generally. Uh, pa Patrick Cariou uh, published a book entitled Yes, Rasta, containing photographs of Rastafarians. Um, Richard Prince, who, who is an artist, uh, took some of those photographs, and he added elements to it, and he created artwork, um, which he sold. So Prince was sued and alleged fair use as, as his main defense. Um, in his deposition, though, Prince had said that he was not trying to comment or criticize Cariou's work. Uh, in fact, he said he didn't really care what Cariou was trying to do in his work. Um, he said that he was not trying to, and I, I quote, create anything with a new meaning or a new message. So if we go back to the Campbell case for a second, we, we see that the Campbell case was a parody, uh, and Judge Suda gave some weight to that. That was criticism. It was parody. It's, it's something, you know, useful. Uh, in, in this case, the artist himself said, well, I wasn't really trying to create anything new. Um, it goes back to whether or not we're just trying to supplant the, the work, um, and, you know, has it truly been uh, transformed? Well, well, the court, in, in this case, the Court of Appeals, held that the fair use, the, the, first, the first factor, citing that it was transformative, said that the intent of the artist uh, to create something new, uh, to comment or criticize an existing work, didn't really matter. Uh, and that the court should really examine how the artwork may be reason reasonably perceived in determining the transformative nature of it. So as you can see from the picture, uh, the artist basically took the existing photograph and he added, uh, you know, some looks like cut out guitar to, to one of the photos, uh, put some other blue colored blotches on, on the on the photograph. Um, when we look at the other, other factors, and we will in a minute, we could see he uses the entire photograph um, which is, is important uh, in, is the third factor. Um, the court in this case also spoke about the market factor, the, the fourth factor, whether or not it affects the market for the photographs and, and had concluded as well that um, Prince's artwork didn't really take away any sales of the book. Uh, it's possible that the court might have been able to really base its holding more on that factor than on the transformative use and, and possibly did not have to go so far as saying that uh, it doesn't matter that the transformative, that the use was not um, really for any other purpose. So let, let's fast forward about a year or so and we come to the Seventh Circuit case of uh, Kynitz versus Scotty Nation and you can find 
find that at 766 F3rd, 756, uh, Seventh Circuit in 2014. Um, what we have here, there's, there's a photograph of Paul Soglin, who was the mayor of Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, the, the photograph itself was owned by Michael Kynitz, uh, who and the photo was posted on the city's website uh, with Kynitz's permission, uh, but it was royalty free. The, the city didn't pay for it. Um, the mayor had stopped some type of college party or block party, uh, and Scotty Nation took the photograph, and you see they altered it, uh, made a t-shirt out of it with the slogan, sorry for partying. Um, the district court had upheld the fair use defense, um, and the seventh court also upheld the fair use defense, but on different grounds, and they also took um, uh, time to criticize the Second Circuit's ruling in Cariou. Um, so the, the, the court here in the Seventh Circuit implied that the Second Circuit's transformativeness standard uh, could potentially take away an artist's right to create a derivative work. As we saw in Section 106, one of the exclusive rights that an author has is the right to create a derivative work. And if you take the transformative use to its most logical extension as far out as it could go, uh, it seems that it might supplant the artist's or, or author's right to create a derivative work. If you could take somebody's book and transform it into a movie, uh, you, you, you may have met the Second Circuit's definition of transformativeness uh, on the Cariou case, and that's what the Seventh Circuit was concerned about. So the, the Seventh Circuit took a much more literal reading of the statute, and they looked at the fourth factor, which is harm to the market, uh, and, and, and they stated that, well, there were no plans to make t-shirts, and there's no harm to the market for the sale of this photograph. Uh, the, the photograph wasn't licensed uh, for royalty in the first place, um, and that on that basis, this, this was a fair use. Um, now, in the, in the intervening years between Cariou and, and Kynitz, um, other cases have not really gone as far as the Cariou case. Um, even the Second Circuit, w w when had, uh, they had an opportunity to comment on it, uh, d didn't really comment on it. Um, so some, some speculate now that uh, the Cariou case may, may be relegated, uh, may be an outlier, and, and maybe it'll be relegated only to appropriation art. Um, so, you know, time will tell, but it, it is out there and, and it is a bit of an outlier. Um, so let, let's look now at the second factor. The second factor of fair use is the uh, nature of the work. You know, the idea is that certain works are closer to the core of intended copyright protection. Uh, fictional works get more protection, if you will, than a factual compilation of, uh, of names. Um, it's fairly straightforward. Um, so if you're quoting from a fictional book or you're transforming uh, something from a fictional book as opposed to uh, something that's factual, um, you, you, you may have less of a chance of actually getting a fair use in using the fictional work. Uh, the third factor, this revolves around the amount and substantiality of the, of, of the, amount, the amount used of the underlying work. Uh, it's both a quantitative and a qualitative standard. So the, 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 one of the famous cases in, in this area is the um, Harper Row Publishers um, versus Nation Enterprises. Uh, it's a Supreme Court case, and you can find it at 471 U.S. 539 in 1985. Um, in that case, Harper Row had published, uh, was about to publish, the memoirs of Gerald Ford. Uh, Nation Enterprises the magazine took 300 words out of the memoirs and publish them. Uh, and they claim that, well, that's a fair use. We didn't use a lot of the memoirs. It just so happened that the 300 words were probably the most important 300 words in the entire memoir, and they had to deal with um, the pardon of Richard Nixon. Uh, so it's the, the heart of the book is, is, is how the court characterized it. Um, they, they, they took the heart of the work, and even though it was just a small amount in comparison to the work as a whole, being that it was such an important part of, of the work, um, that factor weighed against nation enterprises. Um, 
you know, that, that's sort of the, you know, the inherent tension in, in fair use analysis really is uh, that we must weigh the, the artist's right to control their copyright with the overriding public policy of disseminating important information and promoting or arts and sciences. Um, the, the fourth factor is the effect on the market, right? And we kind of saw how this came up in the in the Prince case, uh, Carrie versus Prince. We saw it in uh, in Kynitz. Um One of the earlier cases to speak about it is the Sony Betamax case, where um, Sony was sued by Universal because uh, their Betamax allowed people to record television shows. Uh, and the court had basically said, it's also a Supreme Court case, the, the court had basically said on the, uh, as to the effect on the market, people were really time shifting the shows and that there was no uh, real harmful effect on, on the market for the television shows. Um, so market harm, it's, it's important to distinguish that, uh, number one, one of the questions you need to ask is whether or not it diminishes the market for the old work, for the, for the underlying work. Um, how does it affect the potential market? Uh, in, in the Kynitz case, the court had said, well, there were no plans to license the photograph for t-shirts anyway. Um, so that's a look at the potential market. Um, market harm from the criticism itself does not qualify. Uh, so if there is criticism of a work or parody of a work and that leads to people not wanting to buy the work anymore because it was criticized, that's not market harm. Um, and, and that, you know, is, is stated uh, in, the, uh, in the Campbell case uh, where the, 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 the parody, and just because the song is parody, n number one, the court didn't think that it would affect the market for sales of Roy Orbison album uh, and, and had said basically like, well, you know, if it criticizes Orbison and that's what leads to diminished sales, that's not what the fourth factor is for. So, you know, what, what really, you know, is the role of the entertainment lawyer in, in, in all of this? Um, for, first of all, fair use is, is, is one of the most uh, interesting, I find to be one of the most interesting areas of law because it, it is different. Every case is different and, and the facts are interesting and, and you're dealing usually with interesting uh, subject matter. So, you know, as a transactional entertainment lawyer, the best advice that, that I give my clients is clear everything. Get a license for everything. You're going to use something in a song, you, get, get permission for it. You want to put a poster in the background, get permission for it. Um, that, that's just the safest thing to do. A as we've seen, it's not always possible. In the Roy Orbison case, in the, in the Campbell case, um, two live crew went for the license. Uh, they, they were denied. So what, you know, what do you do in a, in a case like that? Um, that's where you have to sit down and, 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 and figure out, look at the facts, look at the cases, and look at the individual uh, facts in your case and, and, and weigh everything. Um, th this is where an entertainment lawyer, you know, puts their, 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 their self on the line at times when evaluating something in the context of an errors and omissions insurance policy. So if you are production counsel to a film and the film is applying for their E&O policy, one of the things that has to be delivered is a fair use opinion that states that all of the things that are in the film that weren't cleared and are not licensed qualify for fair use. Uh, this comes up a lot in documentary filmmaking where licenses are, are, are not uh, always uh, not easy to get and not, not, not a lot of times documentary filmmaker making a controversial film cannot get a license from their subject. Um, so that is really where uh, entertainment lawyer will, will get highly involved in the fair use doctrine and, and put their own insurance policy on the line by giving an opinion on fair use. Please take a moment to write down the verification code for this Lawline audio course. The code is Fallout, F-A-L-L-O-U-T, Fallout. Please take a moment to write down the verification code for this Lawline audio course. The code is Fallout, F-A-L-L-O-U-T, Fallout. Um. Let's get into the rights of publicity. Uh, th th this, this is another important area, and I'm just going to skim it uh, as, as the 
probably pressed for time. Uh, this, this alone could you know, warrant an entire law school class. Um, so th this is another area that's really particular to entertainment law. Um, the, the right of a publicity claim, so it's also referred to as a misappropriation claim. Uh, it, it arises out of the use of a person's likeness uh, or their voice, uh, some, some aspect of their persona uh, for commercial purposes. Um, it's, a, it's a really a, a property claim. Uh, we should differentiate this from a right of privacy, uh, which, is, which is a different tort um, and does not directly relate to commercial value gained from using a person's persona. So the right of publicity has to do more with the commercial value in somebody's name. Uh, now, obviously, celebrities' names have great value. Uh, companies pay millions of dollars to associate uh, them themselves or their products with celebrities. Um, yet, the right extends to all individuals. Um, and although the economic harm may not be as much to an unknown person, they still have a right of publicity. Um, rights of publicity usually, uh, I mean, they, they are largely a creature of state law. There is no federal publicity statute, although many people have, have called for one. Uh, one does not exist, and it's a creature of state law. And there are more than 40 states that recognize a right of publicity, either by statute or under common law, uh, including both New York and California. Uh, decisions as to which state's law apply obviously are, are governed by conflicts of laws analysis under, under the state law. Um, so while, while each state law is different, uh, there are common elements to the claim. Uh, n n number one, it has to be the use of, of a, a persona of, of some sort. So the name, likeness, uh, voice, etc. There must be a commercial advantage uh, accruing to the defendant. Um, the use had to have been made without consent, and there must be some injury to the plaintiff. Th those are the, the, the basic um, requirements of a right of publicity claim. Um, so let's look at what a persona is, right? A persona can be a, uh, a name, a nickname, a former name, a pseudonym. Uh, it could be somebody's voice. So um, there, there was a case involving a singer, Tom Waits, with Frito-Lay. They used somebody who sounded like him, uh, and they were held to violate his right of publicity because they used something that was widely associated with him. Uh, images, including a look-alike, uh, and, and other attributes that evoke a celebrity's image, like here's Johnny, uh, were associated with Johnny Carson. Um, so let's look at the two, two key states, uh, New, New York and California. Most of the cases uh, arise under one, one, one or two of these states, although there are some important cases in, in other states, um, including in, in New Jersey. Um, Tennessee, Florida, um, but New, New York, uh, you'd look at the civil rights law, sections 50 and 51. Uh, th there is no common law right of publicity in New York, uh, but section 50 says that the use of a person's name without consent is a misdemeanor. So there could actually be a criminal prosecution in New York for um, the violation of somebody's right of publicity. Section 51 gives the private right of action uh, to somebody's name, uh, to somebody whose name or likeness or persona uh, has been used without their permission. Um, in California has, um, I'm sorry, in New York as well, the, the, the right extends only to living persons. In, in New York, the Civil Rights Act is, is, is these sections are really an outgrowth of the right of privacy. Uh, and although there's the commercial component, and this is a right of publicity statute, it's an outgrowth of the right of privacy, and it only extends to living persons. Uh, it's not descendable. California, on the other hand, has a very well-developed common law, uh, and they also have a statute, the California Civil Code, Section 3344, um, the statute is a supplement to the common law, uh, so they're, they're both to be read together. Um, you could bring cases under either or both. Um, the statutory right adds a strict liability component 
um, if the use is knowing and if there is a direct connection between the use and the commercial purpose, there could be strict liability. It also provides for attorney's fees to the prevailing party. Um, in California, the right is descendable and it will last for 70 years after uh, a person's death. So descendability is, is, is a big issue. Um, you know, state law depends whether or not the person's family can inherit the right. Um, obviously important to uh, families of celebrities uh, whose name and likeness, et cetera, are worth uh, quite a bit of money. So we, we look at the case of, it's Milton H. Green Archives versus Marilyn Monroe, LLC, uh, 692 F3rd 983. It's the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, 2012. Uh, and the Ninth Circuit held that Marilyn Monroe was domiciled in New York at the time of her death and that New York law should apply to her estate and that since New York law does not recognize uh, the descendability of the right, uh, her right of publicity was extinguished at death. Um, so that the domicile uh, basically will control uh, where what which law applies uh, and whether or not it is descendable. Um, obviously, this you know wreaks havoc on the estates of of, of many celebrities. Uh, in Indiana, by the way, is is an important state. Uh, their their right of publicity is descendable. Um, their uh, anyway. So let let's take a look at the um, First Amendment and the right of publicity. So. People have a First Amendment right, obviously, to express themselves and to do things. There's a, a balancing act uh, between somebody's right of publicity and somebody else's First Amendment right to create a work based on a celebrity uh, uh, or, or their persona. So the, the first court really to speak about this uh, Supreme Court decision uh, is that of Zucchini versus Scripps Howard Broadcasting, and you can find that at 433. U.S. 562, uh, 1977. Um, Zucchini, Hugo Zucchini, was a human cannonball. Um, he was an entertainer and he had a cannonball act where he would climb into a cannon uh, and shoot himself out of it. Uh, his entire act was about 15 seconds long. Uh, the defendant in the case had recorded his act and broadcast it on the news. Um, they claimed, when they were sued, they claimed that this was newsworthy uh, and they were protected by the First Amendment. Well, the Supreme Court recognized first that under Ohio law, Mr. Zucchini had a right of publicity um, and that the broadcasting of the entire uh, act was not protected by the First Amendment. Uh, and although what Mr. Zucchini was doing might have been newsworthy, um, the newsworthy aspect of it did not require that the entire performance be broadcast. And the, the broadcast of his entire performance essentially undermined his own commercial right in recording and broadcasting uh, or selling tapes of, of a broadcast of, of that performance. Um, so the, generally, expressive works... Um, are protected by the First Amendment. And, you know, we've seen now in Zucchini that it's not a blanket protection. Um, generally, though, a celebrity cannot really stop a book or a movie uh, based on a right of publicity claim um, as long as their name, likeness, and what have you is not being used in a false manner or it's not defamatory in some way uh, or where they're not creating an, an association or implying some sort of a, an endorsement uh, or misleading the public. So uh, w one case, uh, California case, put it this way, um, under the First Amendment, a cause of action for appropriation of another's name and likeness may not be maintained against expressive works, whether factual, factual or fictional. Uh, that, that case was the Daily versus Viacom case, and you can find that at 238 F sub 2nd 1118. Um, Northern District, California, 2002. And while, while that statement is generally true, uh, I think it is tempered by some of the defenses uh, that are used in these First Amendment cases. So, for example, 
Uh, recently, there, there were video game cases. Um, there were two of them in particular in California uh, that held that the video game depicting the likenesses of professional athletes was not protected under the First Amendment, even though video games are entitled to the full protection of the First Amendment. There are, it could be expressive works. Um, that the use in these particular cases of likenesses of a football player in one instance and I believe basketball player in another was not protected. So the, um, the, the, the cases are the first one, Davis versus Electronic Arts, and that is at 775 F3rd 1172. It's a Ninth Circuit, 2015. Uh, and and the, the companion case to that uh, was decided before that was the Keller versus Electronic Arts, 724, F3rd, 1268, 9th Circuit, uh, 2013. So what had happened was the, the players had sued Electronic Arts saying that they were misappropriated their name and likeness, used it in part of their video game. And, and, and what the court in, in, in the, both of these cases had emphasized was that the video game maker used the players doing exactly what they do in real life or what they had done in real life, which was playing football or basketball. And they relied heavily on uh, the No Doubt case. And the No Doubt case is uh, No Doubt versus Activision Publishing. And that's at 192 California Appellate uh, 4th, 1018, page 1018 in 2011. Um, and in, in this case, uh, the video game maker was sued for creating avatars of the band, of the rock band, no doubt, uh, performing. Uh, and, and what they said is that we conclude that the creative elements of the band hero video game do not transform the images of no doubt band members into anything more than literal fungible uh, reproductions of their likeness. So that, that leads us to the transformative use test. Um, and, and this is one of the tests, one of the main tests that courts will apply um, in these rights of publicity cases. Uh, so in, in the video game cases, they, they failed because they, they did not meet the transformative use test. So what is the transformative use test? Well, believe it or not, it was lifted right out of the Campbell case where Judge Suda talked about transformativeness. Uh, and so in evaluating expressive works, uh, courts look at whether the work containing the likeness is so transformed that has, it has become primarily the defendant's own expression rather than the celebrity's likeness. That comes from Comedy 3 Productions versus Gary Satterup, Inc., um, and that's found at 25 California 4th, 387, 2001. Uh, that case concerned an artist's rendering of the Three Stooges on T-shirts, and the court held that there was no real original expression there, um, and it did not transform those images um, enough to really qualify for the transformative use test, and they were not protected by the First Amendment. So th there, there are other tests that uh, courts use, and I won't go into them in, in detail, but I do want to raise the incidental use defense. Um, and the incidental use defense um, is a defense that's raised by users of, of uh, people's personas uh, when there's only some fleeting reference uh, or insignificant use of a persona that is not central to the work or central to the advertisement. It's not actionable. Uh, and the factors to consider in incidental use are um, whether the use has a unique quality or value that would result in commercial profit to the defendant, whether the use uh, contributes something of significance, uh, the relationship uh, between the reference to the plaintiff and the purpose and subject of the work, uh, and the duration, prominence, and repetition of the use. Um, and you can find the, 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 the factors laid out in Illegal versus Time Life books. It is 1994 WL715605, Northern District of California, uh, 1994. Uh, obviously, it's California um, uh, common law uh, defense. You could find something similar. New York has, a, has somewhat of, a, of an incidental use defense as well. Uh, and you could find that in D'Andrea versus Rafla Demetrius, and that is at 972 F SUP 154, Eastern District, New York, 1997. Um, 
So that, I think, really wraps up our, our inquiry today. Um, I hope you have found uh, some of these areas interesting and fascinating. Uh, there, there, there's a lot that you can do to, uh, to read and, and find out more about both rights of publicity uh, and copyright law, especially fair use. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed the program.